Lord, we thank you. We praise you. I ask you, Lord, that you bless your word tonight, Lord. Lord, that you, oh, Lord, that you bless, Lord. The man or the woman that's going to preach tonight, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that you pour out your blessing upon them, Lord Jesus. Lord, that your presence come forth, Lord Jesus. Lord, that we humble ourselves to you, Lord, and let you come forth, Father. Lord, speak to us tonight, Lord. Lead us, Lord, and guide us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the in God's house tonight. <clears throat> um, we've got a guest speaker tonight, and it's one of our own. Sister Jen's going to come and share the word of the Lord tonight. Sister Jen. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so when Pasta had, um, had called me, I missed his call, then he texted me, and I looked at the text message, and it said, would you, you know, do a Bible study? I was like, oh, no. Um, <laughs> but I really want to be obedient. Um, I get really scared to do stuff when God pushes me to do things, and when I'm asked to do something, I want to be obedient. Um, so just pray for me about that, too, because even, like, Pastor had asked me one time to go up in a worship team, and he's like, there was somebody, there was a space over there, and he's like, and I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so I'm just praying now um, to be more obedient. Um, so what I wrote tonight was something that I started writing a while ago. A lot of times I'll even write myself, I'll preach to myself, I'll start writing stuff to minister to myself. Um, and one of the things I started writing was live life as if, as if it was your ministry. Um, there's a book I read, um, her, the what, girl's name is Katie Davis. She's written two books. One is, um, Kisses for Katie and the other one is Daring to Hope. Um, she was a very young girl, 18 years old. She went on a mission field, and it was supposed to be just for a very short time. When, but what ended up happening was God had really touched her. And she came back home for a little while, but she could not forget Africa. She went to uh, Uganda. I said that wrong. Uganda, Africa. Um, and every time when she came home, she just could not forget about all the children that she met over there. So she had asked her parents, can I just please go back just for a little while? Um, the father had agreed, let her go back, and she it just ended up being a whole life decision. She just gave up everything here, went there. She actually adopted 13 children. It's an unbelievable book. I just absolutely adore her. Um, she just really speaks from the heart. She's very honest about her life there and how she struggles. Um, so I started asking myself, you know, like, well, God, I can't just pack up my stuff and go to Africa or Guatemala or anywhere like that. I can do mission trips. But right now, I'm here. I have four children. I'm a single mom. I have responsibilities. What can I do? And again, that's when he gave me the, the word, live life as if it was your ministry. Every man and woman in Christ is called to live out an authentic life in Christ. We need to have a mindset that this life is our ministry. My ministry is my life. Um, in John uh, chapter 3, 1 through 17, um, could you place that up, Bobby? Or somebody? Um, it would be John chapter 13, 1 through uh, 17. Okay. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was to come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, 
He riseth from supper, he laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know thereafter. Hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, But he that washed needeth not wash to not save to wash his feet, but is clean everywhere, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after he washed their feet, and he had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done for you, not to you. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if, if you do them. We read how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He told them, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Um, when I read that, I was like, wow, that's our king. He washed his disciples' feet. I mean, he could have come here and had everything. And he served his disciples, washed their feet. Like, how incredible is that? Um, it's just amazing. Um, as his followers, we are to emulate him, serving one another in lowliness of heart and mind, seeking to build one another up in humility and love. The Lord promised what greatness in his kingdom is attained by those with a servant's heart. Um, and that tells us that in um, Mark chapter 9, verse 35, and also um, chapter 10, verse 44. When we have that servant's heart, the Lord promised we will be greatly blessed. When we are born again, our lives become a powerful testimony of God's power. Whether we know it or not, all eyes are on us. The Bible tells us this. We're ambassadors for Christ. Um, can you put up uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, please? Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Christians are God's ambassadors in that they have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Can you put up um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4? But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. As we go through this world, we represent another kingdom. In uh, John chapter 18, verse 36, um, we see that it's our responsibility to reflect the official position of heaven. We are of this world, but not of it. God's ambassadors are to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we must take the message of our King to the ends of the earth, imploring men and women everywhere to be reconciled to God. Ministry does not necessarily just begin with an assignment at church. It begins the moment we decide to be obedient to God. God can use us in many ways. Um, he can use some of us as Sunday school teachers, um, some of us as a worship part of the worship team, cleaners for the church, sound, video, missionaries, etc. He can use us in both small and big ways. Um, I mean, as we leave sometimes for, um, at the end of the day for service, you see like if the chairs are all crooked, go fix them. You see somebody throws, 
you know, pat, a rapper on the floor, go pick it up. Um, he uses us every, every day. Um, can you put uh, Matthew uh, chapter 22, verses 36 to 40, please? Uh, chapter, Ma- Matthew 22, uh, verses 36 to 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbors as thyself. One of these two commandments hang on all the law and the prophets. Obedience without love is worthless, which is exactly what the Pharisees practiced. Um, But where love is present, a person will automatically set out in order his life in harmony to be with the will that God expressed in his commandments. Uh, most of our ideas in ministry or our mission work is to keep them totally separate from our personal life. However, life is not intended to be like that. We're supposed to have it living as an ongoing ministry. Um, can you put up First Thessalonians um, chapter 2, verse 8, please? Um, Paul writes so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you have become dear to us, we need to want people to understand the gospel, not because of our words, but because we live. Um, Paul understood that it was just, impo- it was just as important I mean, to you know, preach the gospel, but not just preach it, but show you know, by, our, by his actions. Um, ministry is based on dying to ourself and living to please Jesus. God never calls us primarily to a task. He calls us to himself. Before I can do something for God, I must be something in my relationship with God. I can only impart to others in ministry what I possess from my own walk. Therefore, my primary responsibility is that of every believer is to develop godliness through the daily disciple. Um, discipline of a walk with the Lord Jesus. And, of course, that's by getting to know him, reading the word, um, just spending time with him through prayer. Um, if, we don't know, if we don't know Jesus and we're not spending time with him, how, will we, how is it possible that we can even share that with somebody else? Um, our testimony and life experience is a ministry tool to use with others. I share my testimonies with people because I know when I hear other people's, it makes me not feel so alone, and it brings me hope. Um, growing up, my, I always felt very alone. My mom um, is a schizophrenic. My brother had some mental health issues. I had aunt mental health issues. It, it wasn't exactly the most um, pleasurable experience, you know. Um, but I use my stories to tell people because if I can help them through my experiences, why not, you know. Um, even with some of you, like whether it's privately or whether you share with the church, um, that testimony doesn't stop just here. I share that. Um, I, I shared so many of your testimonies, you know, I've shared, um, Bobby's testimony. I've shared Rebecca's testimony. Um, I've shared about stuff with, about Pastor Linda, about how they've given to so many people, um, and it just, like, sometimes people, like, they just look at me, but it's, it's more real to them, you know? Um, they, like, sometimes when you tell them about the Bible, it just seems so far away, but if it's something they can touch or see, it's pretty cool. Of course, I share Priscilla's testimony because that's pretty wild. Um, but it's, it's, it's really cool, you know? Um, and I'll even show people a picture of Priscilla. I'm like, look at her. I mean, this is, she was supposed to be dead, you know? Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool to, so they can relate to that. Um, matter of fact, there's a girl I work with, calls herself, um, calls herself a Christian, but I say she just goes to church as Milan says. Um, <laughs> but she has been diagnosed with lupus like Priscilla has. And, um, I shared, of course, Priscilla's testimony with her and just told her to give it to God, to pray, to get right with God because she's not exactly walking the Christian walk. Um, Anyways, but I've been able to go to Guatemala once, and I hope to have the opportunity to go to other places, like whether it's Africa, India, um, when God plans it, if this is will. However, that's not where God wants me right now. My ministry is here. The first place of ministry is at home. 
Um, and sometimes we don't see that. So many Christians, uh, where we get so busy serving others and that we end up forgetting our own spouses and our kids end up getting the crumbs, the leftover of our love, respect, and attention. It's so, I guess it's easy to see why so many Christian kids have no idea that ministry begins outside the home. We tend to have, be much more patient, kind, and loving towards people that we probably won't have much to do with in the, in the next five years than what we would have towards people who are holding our hands when we die. It can make a big difference if we spoke lovingly and patiently to the very ones under our own roof instead of tearing one another down. We ought to treat each other with respect and kindness. And if parents would treat their kids with the same patience and tenderness that they do with kids in um, their Sunday school class. Um, and it's so true because, you know, for the Sunday school class right now, we have all boys, and that's very fun. Um, <laughs> they, you know, constantly, you know, they, they're hitting the bottom of the table. They're just like this. They don't want to be in there. And you're trying to make it as entertaining as possible um, with, of course, not sacrificing the word. And it, it can be challenging, but you tend to be a little bit more patient with them. It's like, okay, guys, you know, and you, you encourage them. But yet when you're home like myself, I am admitting it, um, you can just be like, all right, come on, I just told you already, you know? Um, so I constantly got to remind myself about that. Um, but funny story, I got to tell you guys this. I shared it on Facebook. I think it's really funny, and it just made me laugh. I thought of it today again, and it just made me chuckle. Um, during Sunday school, we were talking about Paul and Barnabas and how they're missionaries and how um, they, you know, they went to share the good news. So... I said to him, I was like, what is the good news? So <laughs> David goes, and I, I, he, just, he just made me laugh. He goes, Fox News. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> there's nothing good on Fox News. But it was just so sweet and innocent, and it made me laugh. And it just made me so happy because I'm like, this is why I love teaching Sunday school because uh, they have little mouths. Um, can you put up First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8? Um, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. My son, Lucas, is an unbeliever. He's a doubter. Um, and I'm constantly under the microscope with him. Um, he's always watching me and seeing what I do. And, you know, the second that I make a mistake, he's the first one to point it out. But at the same time, he's the one that encourages me. Um, one night, I was just like, oh, I just don't feel like going to church. I'm tired. Like, I got so much to do. And he looks at me. He's like, Ma, no, you need to go to church. I'm like, what are you, trying to get rid of me? He's like, no, you're just so much happier when you come home. And um, I was like, wow, that's really cool. So he sees that, you know, so that gives me hope with my son. Um, what do our neighbors, friends, and coworkers see when they watch us? Do they hear yelling or laughter? Do they see patience and love from us? Do they see us pray and offer prayer? Do they see us act one way at church, but act like a totally different person once we step out the church doors? When we hurt our children, do we apologize for them, for our actions or words? Or do we just have the mentality that we don't need to because we're the adult? Um, it's okay to apologize to your children. You know, um, I see that so many times with adults, like, well, I'm the adult, and, you know, I, I, I said so. And, yeah, it's true. I get that. But at the same time, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And it's okay to apologize to them. You know, there's been many times I've apologized to my kids because I've been upset with them or I snapped at them because I've had a bad day at work. And I go and apologize to them. Um, okay. I think I did that one. Oh, can you put up um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5? For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? One of the best ways to share your faith is to live a godly life. Non-Christians often look at Christians as, as hypocritical because we'll say one thing, but yet we'll do another. Show those close that you care. Spend time with them. Help them with their needs and offer to listen when they have problems. We, not be, we might not be able to answer all their questions, but they can't deny the reality of what God has done in, your, in our lives. 
Sometimes we'll find it's hard to do, but and um, perhaps God is speaking to you about your own need to walk more closely with Him with Him every day. So if you're having a hard time sharing, if you got a qu- kind of question where where you are with God, most of us at work at least forty hours a week. Some of us are allowed to speak freely about Jesus, while other places it can be a lot more difficult. We should be the light in our workplaces. When stressful situations are upon us in our workplace. They should see us not complain or worry, and that is very hard to do sometimes. Um, we need to show them that we're different. Do we participate in gossip? That one I've had. I've got myself in trouble a couple times. Um, it is so easy to, um, to, especially girls is the worst, honestly. Um, <laughs> it is like, you know, like one of the girls will come and they'll say something about one person or the other, and it can be so very quickly easy to get involved in that so now i've learned to and i'm very fortunate where i can play christian music in my work so i do um but it's, it's it can be difficult don't participate in gossip um do we show patience towards others um i was recently convicted when i had to work up at the corporate office and um they had me do a special project up there and one of my kids just kept calling and complaining because they were fighting with each other and they just would not stop calling me. I'm like, oh my goodness, like stop calling me. And instead of just taking a deep breath, shutting my mouth and just saying, you know, God, please help me like work that out over there. I just blurted out, oh my gosh, I'll kill these kids when I get home. So, you know, that exactly didn't look as good to the other people, you know. Um, But I'm telling you this because I'm not perfect, you know, so... (laughs) <laughs> um, so they looked at me, and I'm just like, oh, why did I just say that? Um, <laughs> when God's sh- children obey the Heavenly Father, he's glorified. Jesus told us that the plan for others is to see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Um, can you put up Matthew chapter 5, verse 16? In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Of course, performing good deeds requires obedience to the one who has called us to good, do good deeds. A Christian's testimony of holiness is a strong witness that God is at work in the world. Um, can you put up Psalm 139, verse 13? And I'm going to go right to 16. If I say I'm a law, I'm sorry. My daughter told me I said that a lot. She's like, don't say um a lot tonight. Okay. Um, oh, see, I just said it. All right. David praises. <laughs> but thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous at thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, Thine eyes, de- thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Every moment was laid out before a single day has passed. God has used us all as a living testimony to share with others. He uses us, no, I'm sorry. He uses it to mold us, to shape us for our service to him. God uses our abilities, talents, failures, successes, interests, gifts, personality, and life experiences for his glory. As Christians, we can influence others. Jesus describes what it's like to be in a, um, as true Christians in Matthew verse, um, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Can you put that up there? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Jesus was looking over the multitudes of his day, and he saw corruption, and he just saw the disintegration of life at, at every point. It's breakup, 
And because of his love for the multitudes, he knew that the thing that they needed the most was Saul in order that the corruption should be stopped. He saw them wrapped in gloom, sitting in darkness, groping amid mists and fogs, but he knew they needed above everything else light. The world's very corrupted and decayed. We can see that now. Um, as we can see, we turn on the news and we just see that it's just getting darker and darker. Paul says in 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 13, that evil men, impostors, will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Men, man is being affected with sin and has no cure apart from God. The world loves its own way and hates God's way. Because of Christ, believers are those who belong to God and are eager to do what's good. What's the difference between believers and unbelievers? One is spiritually alive and one is spiritually dead. The believer influences the unbeliever by what he is, not by, why, by what he has. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Christ didn't say, you have salt and light to dispense, but rather, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The believer's very presence in the world acts as salt and light, preventing moral corruption and exposing error. The only question, as Jesus goes on to say, is whether we are tasteful salt and visible light. Um, can you put up John, uh, John chapter 9, verse 5? As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But Jesus now has physically left this world for a time. His light now, his light now shines through his body, the church. Can you put up uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 13? Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Yeah, chapter 1, yeah, ver chapter one verse 13. Okay. Um, For he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Can you put up Ephesians chapter 5? Sure, yeah, it is kind of staticky. That's okay. It is a little annoying. I don't want to complain too much. Is that better? Okay. All right. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, please. Uh, verse 8. Chapter 5, verse 8. Okay. But you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. We are God's salt to retire the moral corruption and his light to reveal the spiritual truth about him. God changed us from being part of the corruption world to be in salt that can help preserve it. God has transferred us from the light of darkness to his kingdom to be the agents of light to, um, and love to others. As Christians, we must distinctively and delightfully differ from the world they're called to influence. We can't influence the world for God if we are worldly ourselves. We can't give light to the world if we hide our light and revert to, to a lifestyle of darkness ourselves. Um, and it's so true. Like so many Christians, um, Pastor Manny was here. He gave an awesome, um, Bible study and he was talking about how many Christians, you know, they'll come here, they'll raise their hands and they'll worship God. But then the second they go outside the door, they're a totally different person. Um, and I don't want to be that person. Um, people watch us. Like I said, they watch everything that we do. They watch what they, when we talk about TV shows we watch, when they hear about the music that we listen to. Um, one thing that upset me a lot, I couldn't believe, was how many women went out running and bought the, um, the book Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, disgusting. Um, and I just, I just couldn't believe it that that many people would do it. And I've had many conversations with women, both Christians and non-Christians, 
And um, I've said to them, you know, I don't understand. You see Hollywood, and they have the big Me Too mo uh, movement. But I'm like saying, they're like, well, aren't they hypocritical? They're having a big Me Too mo movement and how, you know, they don't want to be sexually harassed. Now, I'm not giving a man any excuse. I'm not. Like, a man does not belong ever sexually harassed in a woman. I'm not saying that. But practice what you preach. You guys are pouring out of Hollywood every time you turn on TV I mean, for the TV shows, it's like pornography. Like, everything's, it's, everything's sex. Like, and trying to even watch television shows with my children, that wholesome can be very difficult um, between the music and all that stuff. That I don't want that book representing me, you know? Um, and even, like, the Women's March and stuff, how many Christians were over there. And, and you see these women, um, like Madonna and um, these other celebrities, those women don't represent me. Um, but it's just amazing how many Christians went flocking over there. Um, but yet they forget that when the women who were over there with their the pro life signs, they those pe they it, it just doesn't make sense. They're where's the baby's rights? The babies in the womb who are women they're going to turn to be women. What about their women rights? It's just it's just amazing of how the world just 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 they're very it's just darkness. Um, Today, I had a, um, a friend um, contact me, and um, she's so blind. It's unbelievable. We've been friends since I've been in sixth grade. Um, every time I push her, somehow she just keeps coming back in. I push her away, she comes back in. And I've been praying about a lot because I, told, I prayed today to God, and I'm like, you know, if you're bringing her, keep bringing her in my life because this is, I'm going to be used as your vessel to share the gospel for her to be saved, then please do it. I'll go through it. I'll deal with this. But if she's just here to corrupt me, to bring darkness in my life, then you need to remove her. So please keep that in prayer. Um, cause I don't like to turn anybody away. I really don't. I like to help everybody. Um, but sometimes we just we can't help certain people. Um, we can't open someone's heart to the truth of the gospel, but God can by his spirit. Sometimes the only thing we can do is pray. Um, the Apostle Paul was an eloquent, but God used him because he depended on the Holy Spirit to guide him. Um, can you put up 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5? And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I mean, he used Paul, and we see it over and over again in the Bible of how many people that he used. Um, and I, Paul's a pretty cool guy. I mean, you got to think about that. Can you imagine you're the one that, um, crucified and beat on all these Christians and, you know, and I mean, killed people and, but yet here he is coming. Hey, got good news. Like, oh, I want to talk to you about Jesus. I mean, that, that took a lot of courage and that obviously was definitely from the Holy Spirit, but, um, I mean, he, he depended on God for that. I mean, he had to be in fear and trembling and wondering what these people are thinking. I mean, I'm sure he had to be in fear of his own life quite a bit because if, if you come, you're coming to me, you killed all my family, and you're telling me about Jesus. I don't know. So, um, but I, so that's pretty amazing. Uh, ministry is about serving others. Jesus said in Matthew, um, anyone that wants to be a leader among you, you must be a, be a servant. And if you want to be right at, the top, you must serve like a slave. Your attitude must be like my own. But I did not come to be served, but to but to serve. Um, and in Luke chapter 22, verses 26, it says, but among you, the one who serves best will be your leader. We were created to serve others. Um, can you put up Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10? If it is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Jesus Christ, long ago he planned that we should spend lives in helping others. Even before we were born, God planned a life of service for, um, for us. 
One reason why so many people are so miserable today is because they miss the point of what they're created for. That's what we're created for. He, we were created to worship him and to serve him and others. Um, there's the song that we often sing in church, um, I give myself away so you can use me, but do we mean it? Um, can you put up chap- uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 7, verse 4, please? Okay, we belong to Christ. Um, you are a part of the body of Christ, and now you belong to him in order that we might be useful in the service of God. God says that the way we have to know that we're the part of the body of the Christ is that we serve others. Serving is proof is serving is a proof of our identity as members of his family. We serve God by serving others. Serving others is the way to serve God. Can you put up Colossians chapter 3 verses 23 to 24? Um and whatsoever ye do it, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. It is the Lord you are serving. No matter what you're doing, who are you doing it for? You're doing it for the Lord. In Matthew uh, chapter 25, verse 40, Jesus says, What you have done for the humblest of my brothers, you have done for me. He states it positively. If you feed and clothe others, then you feed and clothe me. If you haven't fed and clothed others, then you haven't fed and clothed me. The greatest honor is to serve the Lord. We owe God everything. Um, can you put up Romans chapter 12, verse 1, please? Okay. I beseech you, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The reason why we serve the Lord is because of what God has done for us, because of his mercy. When I think of what Jesus has done for me, the sacrifice he has made for me, there is just no sacrifice that I can ever make for him that will ever compare to what he's done for me. Can you put up um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What that basically is telling us is that keep busy in your work for the Lord. Since you know nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever without value. When I go home and play with my kids or spend time with them, that's just as, as important as um, preparing this message. You know, when I hang out with them, um, just in like slowly having conversations with them to find out like how their day is and talk to them and slowly bring in the gospel. Like I try to kind of, you know, sneak stuff in there. Um, that's just as important, like I said, as preparing this message. Um, going out of my way for someone and helping someone so they can do something else that matters in God's eyes. Um, like tonight, you know, Pastor Bob has something else to do. He asked me to do it, and here I am. Um, can you put up uh, Mark chapter uh, Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-five? For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. If you're not serving, you're not living. You're just existing. Can you put um, John chapter 12, verse 26? If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And can you put up um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, please? His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
Our ministry isn't just for the people outside the doors, but with each other as well. It's not up to the pastor just to be for, there for all of us. We should be there for one another and to encourage one another. If we see someone that's not at church, it shouldn't be just up to the pastor to reach out to them. Call them, pray with them, study with them, text them. There's so many different ways to you know, contact each other now. Um, invite someone over for coffee. We should fellowship and not just with the same people and get all clicky. Um, and that's one thing I've been trying to do, um, trying to branch out, whatever. If I haven't hung out with you, I will. Um, because I just think it's just so important. Like every single one of you just are so important. You know, each one of you have different stories. And I just love getting to know each one of you and to hear your stories and to, you know, God is going to use each one of you in my life as I hope God will use me in your life. Um, I remember when Bob Lewis had left and he went to Florida um, and I um, had said to him, hey, we should go out. You know, we went out for, for breakfast and we, you know, hung out and stuff. And we laughed. And I remember when he left, I was really sad because I was like, wow, like, Here's this guy, he's been in his church, been a member for five years. I don't even know him. And here he is. So, sorry, Bob, I'm glad you're back. <laughs> um, I really am. And I, because he has a lot, you know, he prays, he prays so beautiful. And I love when he prays, and I can't wait to see how God's going to use them in the church. Um, so, yeah, if you guys don't have my number, I will give you my number after. I love when we do like the chain texting or whatever. Um, just sometimes you just need to be encouraged during the day. Like sometimes something will happen real quick and I'm like, oh, I just got to send out a prayer thing. And I get sad because sometimes there'll be only like three or four people on that text message. I want all of you to be on that message because, hey, let's be, we're all prayer warriors and we need to pray. Um, so like I said, it's just if you haven't hung out with somebody else, do it. Go for it. You know, we all have um, different stuff or whatever. Um, so that's my thought. Anyways, um, in Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 42, um, they, can you put that up there? I'm sorry. Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 42. Um, they continually, they continue steadfastly um, in apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. We read that one of the four things that the early ch church did was devote themselves to fellowship. Fellowship was a very important part of their reason of meeting together. It was just, um, it was their objective. We often hear people talk about fellowship. We hear that, we hear it is said that we need more fellowship, but our modern idea of fellowship has become so watered down that the word no longer carries the same meaning as it did in the New Testament times. Um, like a lot of times we'll have the women's fellowship and it's sad because there's so many empty chairs there. You know, if you don't come to the um, the women's meeting, you're really missing out. It's amazing. It's just women. It's sometimes we can't talk in front of you guys. You know, a certain things or whatever. Um, so it's just really nice. And even for the men fellowship, if you get that text message, go to it. You know, you guys, there's things that you guys can have conversations about to to be there and to encourage um, one another. We are not surprised that the early church devoted itself to the apostle teaching. And also to prayer. Apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there are the two. These are the two most important means of growth, power, effectiveness in the Christian life. And this is every and everywhere is evident in the rest of the Scripture. But Luke tells us uh, tells us these early Christians also devoted themselves to fellowship. They didn't just have fellowship; they devoted themselves to it. Fellowship was a priority, and one after when one of the objectives was uh, of gathering together. Some of us are so quick to run out of the door after church rather than just take a few minutes to ask someone how they are, to make plans together or pray with them. Um, and it's true. I mean, hey, like, let's face it. I mean, we have Saturday and Sunday. Some of us got pot roast cooking. We, got, we have to go grocery shopping. Um, and I get that. But just take a few minutes, though. Talk to somebody. Um, and some of us, like I said, will flock to certain people. But if you see somebody kind of, like, hanging alone, go talk to them. Um, even the children... Um, and it's something, something that's been kind of bothering me, so I'm going to say it. The kids need to be talked to. They need to be talked to. Like, I know sometimes people don't know how to talk to children, but, you, but if you don't talk to a child in this church, please do. Take, like, two seconds to talk to them. Um, 
I've heard kids tell me that sometimes they don't feel like they belong here, that they feel that they're not loved. And I know that's such an awful thing to say, but that's what's been told to me from a couple of kids. Um, and that makes me really sad. I'm not going to tell you who they are because it's not that's between me and them. Um, but just take a few minutes with them. You know, they, they're, it's really scary to be a kid and with all adults, you know, like I try, always try to encourage Haley to come to the women's meeting, but she always feels like, well, you know, she's not a woman. Um, but I keep trying to push her and I'm going to make her come next time. She's gonna, not going to have a choice. Um, <laughs> but like, but it's just so important there. Like they're the teenagers right now. They're such at an awkward age. Just take a few minutes and just speak with them and maybe ask if you can pray with them. Um, they just really need the encouragement. You see all the evil in the world and they just need that extra time. Um, they have it, you know, rough out there. So, I mean, that's pretty much my message, you know, um, but I just wanted to say like, if there's anything I could ever do for you, please use me. Let me serve you. And that's it.